Uh, it's time for, for our program to continue. It's time for our next talk. And I practiced my Dutch. It's Hurt de Pachter and Finding Bugs in Seconds. Please, let's hear it for Hurt. Uh, welcome, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed your lunch and uh, that you're ready for this talk. So uh, let's jump uh, into it. I'm Gert de Pachter. That's the correct pronunciation. Gert is also fine. Uh, online, I'm known as BackNT, and I'm 27 years old. Uh, currently, I work for Your Surprise, which is a company in the Netherlands that creates personalized gifts. So let's say you want your face this big on a T-shirt. Give it to all your friends. You can buy that at us. Uh, we also do mugs and a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, so if you're looking to buy a gift, personalized, you can get it from us. Now, like a lot of uh, other businesses in the industry, we're dealing with a lot of bugs in our code base. And of course, we like to get rid of these bugs. Uh, now, the talk is titled Finding Bugs in Seconds. And the finding part really is going to be a matter of seconds. But uh, the actual fixing part is something you're going to have to do on your own which may take a bit more time. Now, the method by which we're going to be finding these bugs is called static analysis. Static analysis may sound like something very big, scary. Maybe we need to learn a whole bunch of stuff. We need to write very specific code. But in reality, it's quite simple for us. We have our PHP code. We give it to the static analysis. And then we're going to get a big list of all the errors in our code base. There's probably going to be a lot of errors. Uh, unless, of course, you're already running these tools, but usually there's quite a lot. Now, the kind of errors we're going to be finding, um, well, your code can have bugs in your syntax. So the syntax of your code is invalid. You usually don't want this. Um, you could also say that your uh, code doesn't pass your coding standards, so maybe the tabs and the spaces are wrong, the parentheses. Um, your code can also be, uh, have bugs in the functionality of the code. So your code doesn't do what it is supposed to do. Now, the functionality part you can check with your unit tests, which I assume everyone here, of course, writes. I'm going to pretend everyone here just cheered and was like, yeah, we're writing so much unit tests. Um, but as you can see, there's a big gap between your code being valid syntax and your code actually doing what it is supposed to do. And this is where our static analysis comes in. And we're mostly going to be focusing on the types of our program. So are the types correct? Are we passing the right parameters along? Are we returning the right things? All those kind of things. Now, this may seem a bit abstract right now. So we're going to play a little game together that I like to call Spot the Bug. Uh, I've prepared a few pieces of code. And we're going to walk through them together. And then once you spot what the bug is, I'd like you to raise your hand, and then we'll take it from there. So let's start with this class called hello. It has a world property, which we're setting in the constructor. And we also have the hello world method, which is returning a string, which is hello concatenated with this world. Now later on, we instantiate this class, and then we're going to echo the world property. So who knows what this bug is? And I'm going to take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were with the striped shirt. What do you think the bug is? Exactly. So we're trying to access a private property here, which is something that's not allowed in PHP. You're going to get a fatal error if you actually run this code. So don't do this. Now, let's take a look at this second example. We still have our hello class. We even added some types this time. We have the world property, which is annotated as an int. Uh, we're setting it in the constructor still. And we're still returning hello concatenated with this world. So if you know what the bug is, raise your hand. Uh, I think a few people have seen it here in the front. Yes, exactly. We're trying uh, to set an integer. Well, we're trying to set a string to a property which is annotated as an int. And now you may be thinking here, well, does this really matter? You know, during runtime, everything is going to be fine. 
uh, during runtime, there's no property there. So the string is just going to be a string there, and the returning in the hello world method is going to be fine. But of course, this is a rather small contrived example. Let's say you have a class with you know, 37 properties or so, and then one of them has the wrong annotation. It's a different class than what it is supposed to be. And you're going to be working with those properties. Maybe you're adding a new method to this class, and you're going to be calling methods on that class that don't exist, and you're going to run into errors then. Or you know, perhaps, uh, as you can see, this isn't a typed property. Maybe you're going to upgrade to PHP 7.4, or maybe even 8, and you're going to add typed properties. Now, you don't want to do that by hand, so you're going to be using a tool that does it all for you. And then you're going to run into errors then. So this may not be an error right now, but this is almost either going to be an error in the future, either on your dev or in, even in production, if you're pushing it, actually, or it's at least going to take a developer a whole lot of time to figure out exactly what this code is supposed to do. So make sure your annotations are correct. Now onto the third and last example. Now we've gotten rid of our hello class, and instead we got a config class, uh, which takes a directory, uh, or dir property. It even has a default value, so you can construct it without any arguments. And then we have the get dir method, which returns a string. So it returns this dir, unless that's falsy. So you know if you passed in the empty string. In that case, it's going to return get cvd, which is get current working directory, which means that's the directory the current script was uh, executed from. So does anyone know what the bug here is? Uh, you there. Sorry, can you say that again? No, no, I'd say that's fine. You probably don't want a directory named zero anyways. Uh, let's see, you're in the middle. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, this is uh, valid in PHP. It's a shorthand for the ternary operation where you just say, if this there is falsy, then we're going to return the part after that. Otherwise, we're going to return this there. Uh, uh, no, that's also not it. Uh, you there. That's actually it, yeah. <laughs> get CVD can return false. So we're saying this method is returning a string, but instead it's returning string or false. Now, get CVD, um, it returns false in case you actually deleted the directory you're currently in. So this shouldn't happen too often, especially not in a web environment. But you know, we don't know if this code is a web environment. It could be ran in your CLI. Maybe it's a cron job somewhere. And in that case, you're going to run into a type error. You may be thinking, well, it's not the end of the world. You know, it crashes our program and we're done. But it's not a great solution because you shouldn't be catching a type error. In fact, you shouldn't be catching any errors at all. Uh, ben had a talk yesterday about the exceptions and the errors. The errors are something the language throws when you, the programmer, or you know, one of your colleagues, of course, did something wrong. You did something that's not allowed. In this case, returning false from a method that should return a string. So you shouldn't be catching those. So instead here, you might want to um, you know, assign getCVD to a variable, check if that's false, and then throw your own very specific exception. Even give it a nice message so you can debug it later if it happens. And uh, that should, should, just, yeah. Yeah, should just be a better solution here instead of just letting the type error continue because you don't want to catch those. In the exception, you can maybe ask the user for some input or just ask them what the hell they're doing anyways, deleting the directory they're working in. Now, what I'd like you to realize now is the amount of time this took us. And these were three small classes, all three less than 20 lines of code. Now, we had to read the code, reason about it. We even had to know 
a few edge cases in PHP, like what get CVD does in case of an error somewhere. And that's time that we're spending every day doing code review. We're reviewing uh, the code of our colleagues. We're also actually reviewing our own code as we're writing it. And that's time that you're wasting. That's time that you could have been spending on thinking about maybe the architecture of the code, or if this is even the right solution for the problem we're trying to fix with our code. Um, and I say this is time wasted because we don't have to do that ourselves. We have these static analysis tools for it. And uh, I'd like to get into that now, the what kind of tools there are. There's a bunch of static analysis tools for PHP right now, but there's two that are the most well-known and the most used, and uh, I'd like to go over those. The first one is PHP STAN. Now, a few years back, I realized that PHP STAN has, in fact, nothing to do with the Eminem song about STAN, about being a PHP STAN, you know, this big PHP fan. It doesn't have anything to do with it. It just stands for PHP Static Analysis, which really is a wasted opportunity, in my opinion, but oh well. It was made by this guy, Andre Mirtes, and he's been working on it for years and just basically working on it almost every day. The second one is Psalm. Psalm was made by the people from Vimeo. Because Vimeo has a very big PHP code base, and they're writing a lot of bugs in their code, as most people are. And at some point, they realized it was easier to write a tool that tells them what the bugs in their code are than to stop writing bugs altogether. Now, thankfully, we don't have to write this tool anymore, so we can, it can be even easier for us. We can just use the tool. But it's just that much easier, actually, to create a tool than to stop writing bugs altogether, because you're just never going to do that. And my biggest advice for any of these tools is really to just start using them. And they're widely adopted, especially in open source, and they're just going to save you a lot of time. Uh, yeah, basically, they're just saving you so much time in dev environment, and they're also going to be preventing bugs from happening. Running them is surprisingly easy. Just vendor bin PHP 10a after you've done a composer require. The a here is short for analysis, by the way. Or just a vendor bin psalm after you've uh, required that. And that will tell you a whole bunch of errors in your code base. Now, of course, you really don't have the time to spend three months fixing every single type, possible type error in your code base. So thankfully, both these tools have levels. They're configured through uh, levels, which means for PHP stand, the lowest one is zero. And at level zero, it is really only going to give you errors that once that code is executed, is going to be a fatal error, basically. And then you go up and up in the levels until level eight, which is currently the maximum level, which will tell you basically every error in your code base. Psalm is the other way around because consistency. And uh, for them, level one is the most strict level. And then level seven or something is the lowest, which you can start with. And starting with PHP stand, that's what we did. And we started at level zero. I did this uh, merge request during my internship at George Price because I took it upon myself to do a lot of code review. I found a lot of bugs and I was like, yeah, I don't want to find these kind of bugs. So this was the merge request. Now, this is only 11 files that were changed. Two of those were the composer JSON and the composer log. Another two were the config for PHP stand and our CI file. And then the rest, we, we had some really weird auto loading, so I kind of had to fix that first. And then the rest of these errors were actually classes that were referencing other classes that didn't exist anymore and was just dead code which had been in our code base for years. So starting at level zero was real easy, and it doesn't take a lot of time to do this. Uh, now, of course, you don't want to stop at level zero. So uh, this was still during my internship, but one of my colleagues decided, well, we want to bump this up a bit. So we got to level four. Now, as you can see, this is quite a lot of changes. 139, we had a decently sized code base. Most of these were due to our coding standard, which required doc blocks on every method. Even if they didn't make sense, they just were doc blocks required, which means a lot of doc blocks were completely wrong. So PHP stand was complaining about them very soon, so we threw away a whole bunch of uh, 
broken dog blocks. Um, and this took my colleague, I think, two days or so. And at this point, we were really starting to see uh, the result of using PHP stem. We were finding bugs before they ever got into production. Uh, then a while later, I was actually hired at your surprise, and I said, well, level four is nice. We can do better. So we went up to level five. As you can see, this was another 65 files that were changed. And this made our code base even more strict in our types. Now, we could have gotten on and on and bumped it to level six, seven, and eight. Uh, but we didn't want to spend all our time on that. So instead, we opted to create a baseline. This is something you can do both in PHP stand and in Psalm. And a baseline is basically you let the tool generate a big list of all the possible errors in your code base. And you're going to write that list into a file. And then you're going to ignore all those errors. That's the great part. You're just going to say, well, I don't care anymore. I'm, I'm going to pretend they're not there. And this may seem counterintuitive, because we were just fixing all these errors. Why are we going to ignore them now? And the reason is that this allows us to start uh, to make sure that all our new code is uh, immediately up to the highest standard of PHP STAN. So that means that all our new code needs to be as strict as possible. And any changes we make to our old code can no longer introduce any new errors on level 6, 7, or 8 in our case. So this means that every bit of code you write is immediately going to be strict. Now you can still take some time every once in a while, fix some errors on the baseline, and slowly reduce it. But this allows you to uh, get started with that way sooner. Now, I would advise against starting with this baseline, because you may be coming home, uh, maybe coming to work uh, this Monday, probably, and you're going to be, people, I got a great idea. I'm going to introduce PHP then. I'm going to make a baseline file. We're going to be so strict from now on. And your colleagues are going to hate you for it. They're really going to hate you because suddenly there's this tool that's telling them that almost everything they're doing is wrong. They're doing their no call asks wrong. They're doing casts that may fail. They're uh, running properties where they shouldn't be. It's just, it's all wrong. And <laughs> they're just not going to like that. But if you start out uh, slow, start at level zero, bump it up, let them really see what the added value of these tools is. Let them see that these tools will catch bugs before they reach production. And then you can add the baseline once they actually understand it. Maybe for you, you can start at level, uh, you can bump it to level four and then decide, well, it's, it's time to create the baseline. But don't start with it right away. Now, of course, if you and your colleagues are already used to tools like this, then be my guest and create a baseline and start with it right away. But usually I would advise against it. Now, once you're at these more strict levels, you can really, you need to learn to trust these tools. Because these tools um, will tell you what's wrong, and you can, yeah, basically you can just trust them. Because I've seen a lot of code that look like this. We have a function that does something apparently, and it takes an int or a string. We've annotated that. Now, this is pre PHP 8 code, so you can do a union type in the language. So, you know, just, just to be sure, we're going to check inside of the function. Is it a string or is it an int? And if it's neither, we're going to throw an exception. And really, you don't need to do this anymore. You can just comment it out or preferably get rid of the code, but it's up to you. Because um, these tools will make sure that you cannot call this method with anything else. If you call this method with null, the tool will tell you that's not allowed. You're not going to do that. Now, that does mean that this tool needs to run in CI and that you cannot merge this code into production unless your CI is green, unless these checks pass. Otherwise, you might as well not be using these tools. And the beauty of uh, running these tools in your CI is that your CI time is going to become your compile time. Now, if you've been using a compiled language, um, you may have seen something like this, which is a compile error which just means you're doing something that's not allowed by the language for whatever reason, and your code won't compile, so your code cannot run. But if our CI time is going to become our compile time, that means that our code cannot run in production unless our CI is green. So our code cannot run in production unless PHP stand or Psalm, whichever one you're using, 
works and tells you that all your code is right. So, like I said, it's important to run these tools in CI because otherwise you shouldn't bother. Um, now, because you write less code because of this, because you don't longer need to do all these checks, you can also write less tests. And I noticed you were all very excited about the unit tests, but you can actually write a bit less now because you no longer need to check what happens if you call this method with anything but an int or a string because you can't do that anymore. And that just means you write less code, less tests, and probably also less bugs because of this. Now, some of you may have been sitting here thinking, well, you know, I got this framework which does a lot of things. Um, you know, are there any Laravel developers here? Yeah, I, I see some hands. WordPress? <laughs> At least one. Uh, there's plugins for these. Uh, for PHP standard, they're called plugins. For Psalm, they're called extensions. But these plugins will help uh, the tools understand what your framework is doing. So, for example, with Laravel, it may understand how your models uh, are connected, how, what uh, the properties of those are, and what types those are. So it will actually tell you if you're trying to access a property that's not actually on the model. Uh, for WordPress, it can understand the themes and how the plugins all work together. There's even plugins for Drupal and Symfony, even for Doctrine to help it understand the DQL you're writing. Um, now, of course, if you're writing your own magic in your code base, it may have some trouble understanding what's happening with that. It may not exactly know what your code is doing if you have all kinds of magic methods. Now, that doesn't mean you can't use these tools. It just means they're not going to be as effective for a small part of your code base. But for the rest of it, it's still going to perfectly understand what's happening. Now, of course, if you stop writing all that much magic or get rid of it, then the tool will also understand that part of your code. But even with some magic, these tools are still effective. Now, I talked about finding these bugs in your code, but that's not all these tools do. They're actually adding new features to the language itself. Uh, now, they do so through annotations. So one of the examples is the read-only property. Now, of course, uh, once we get PHP 8.1, we're getting read-only properties in the language itself. But we can already get these just through these annotations. So we have our class A with a full property, which is marked as read-only. It's set in the constructor. And by the way, this is kind of the part of the presentation where I gave up on naming things. Um, but we just instantiate the class. And once we write, try to write to this full property, wait, yeah, we're going to get this error. Uh, during our CI or when we run the tool, saying that we're trying to, wait, a foo is marked read only, this one. So this means that after years and years and years, we can get rid of our getters in our code base. We no longer need them, which also means less tests, by the way. Um, so that just means less code, less tests, all thanks to this read only property. And your tooling is checking it, so you can be sure that these properties can no longer be written to. Uh, now, another thing we can do is mark a class as immutable. Now, if you've done functional programming, immutability and pure functions uh, may sound natural to you. If it doesn't, um, a pure function means that uh, the function is just input creates output. If you give it the same input, you're always going to get the same output, no matter what. And also important, it's not going to change anything outside of this method. So that means you can't write to the database or a file system. You can't read uh, from the database because you know reading it might affect your output. So you don't want to do that. And uh, the, the beauty of these pure functions is that they become incredibly easy to test. You can create a whole bunch of unit tests for them because it's just input creates output. You don't have to worry about mocking a database, about mocking your HTTP calls or something like that because there's not going to be any. So if you can encapsulate your business logic in these pure methods, you're going to have a much easier time testing those, and you're really going to be sure that your business logic is actually checked. So if you're doing DDD, try to add these to your uh, domain services. It should really help you out. 
Now the error here is that we're, uh, you cannot call an impure function from a pure context. Um, for all the internal PHP functions, um, Psalm knows what uh, functions are pure and impure. Forgot to mention, actually, this one is not in PHP stand yet. It is in Psalm. Um, but yeah. So Psalm knows the internal PHP functions, which ones are pure, which ones are impure. For your own classes, you're going to have to add this annotation a lot. Uh, for third-party code, some, uh, some third-party codes are actually adding this to their libraries. So, for example, WebMozart assert, which is a popular assertion library. That one has the pure annotations for all the actual pure assertions. So you can use those in a pure context. Um, so try this one out uh, with immutability. It should save you a lot of time and make your testing easier, hopefully. Uh, now this is another one. Um, people in the PHP community have been talking about generics for quite a few years now. I remember a couple of years back there was even talk of splitting off the language in P++ just so we can have these kind of things. Uh, which was, uh, I don't think that ever got started, but oh well. But the reality is we already have generics in PHP. It's just with annotations like this. So it's not in the language itself. But th these tools edit for us. Now, this one is in both Psalm and PHP stand and has been for a couple years now. And uh, the syntax works like this. We say Psalm template T or PHP template, PHP stand template T, which means this class is a generic. And the type we're going to be using, we're going to call T throughout this class. Now we have the constructor, which takes an array of T. It sets it to the items property. And then we have the add method, which is uh, taking a value of type T and adding it to the items list. Now on line 21, we're saying this class is A of type string, which means that for this instance of class A, anywhere we've written T, we can now see this as string, which means the constructor takes an array of strings. Items, uh, the property, is an array of strings. The add method, you may have guessed it, takes a string. Um, and this means that line 23 here is fine. Line 24 would give us this error, that argument A uh, expects string, but the integer tree was provided. Uh, now, generics are real nice for uh, array-like classes. So for example, the doctrine collections have actually added these um, template types to the collection classes, which means that Psalm and PHP stand will automatically understand uh, how these collection classes work if you add the right annotations in your code base saying this is a collection of strings or a collection of this specific class. So it will understand what happens in your loops, everything like that. Uh, yeah, and of course, generics are also nice for methods where uh, the input determines the output. So a method where if you put in a float, it's going to return a float. You put in an int, it's going to return an int. Those kind of methods, it's really nice to add generics. And really, once you start playing with generics, um, you're really going to find more and more use cases uh, that just really help you write nicer code. Uh, now, this is another thing we finally have. It's just somewhat like enums, but not really. Uh, on the get messages method, we say that uh, this is a parameter of self colon colon state underscore something. Now this means that the state uh, parameter needs to be any of these three uh, state constants. So, okay, I don't know, or no. Those three are the only ones allowed because, you know, we've set it there that it needs to match state underscore something. Now, if we happen to call this with something else, we would get this error, that get state message expects one of threes, but something el else was given. Um, now, this means actually that these tools also understand literal types in our uh, code base. So that means that we can actually annotate uh, our methods with, you know, this needs to take the, the integer 0, 1, 2, or 3. That's all it takes. It means that if you call it with anything else, 
you would get an error. Um, so, of course, we got the literal type false in PHP 8.0, I think, but these tools just add all the other possible literal types as well, and they understand how it works. Now, to recap, um, these tools are going to find errors for you, and you're going to find them quick. It's, it's really going to take seconds to run this tool uh, and tell you what the errors are. Now, if you have a big code base, it may take a minute or so, but after that, they have a cache, and it's going to be blazingly fast. Um, start using them today, or you know, once you get back to the office, uh, you, you have until then. But start using them, start small, start at level zero. If your code has errors on level zero, they're probably going to be fatal errors anyway, so there's really no hard feelings <laughs> in adding it at level zero. And then start bumping it up, you know, start making your code a bit stricter and start finding all these weird edge cases in your code that you never thought about and fix those errors. And then, of course, once you're at, at a strict enough level and your colleagues like the, the tool, create that baseline. And trust these tools. They're right like 99.9% .9 of the time. Now, a couple of years back, I would have argued they weren't as trustworthy because I had to open a lot of issues back then with them saying, hey, this piece doesn't work, something's wrong here. But these days, I'm opening an issue maybe once a month, and then usually it means I did something actually wrong and the tool was right anyways. But these tools are right. They've been battle tested in a lot of open source projects and a lot of closed source projects as well. And while you're fixing these bugs, enjoy all these new features. You're, you're getting them for free. You're getting generics today, read-only properties, immutability, all those kind of things. You're getting them right now, so why wait? Um, that's been it for me. If you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter, on GitHub, both as Backend T. I also have a blog on which I really don't write enough anymore, uh, but I'll probably do something later. Uh, and this has been it. So I'd like to open it up to questions. Do we have any questions for Hurt? Yeah, just a second. We're going to get you the mic. Uh, first row. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the talk. It was really interesting. Uh, the thing I was wondering about, so um, you're obviously now binding your code base to a tool. Is that something you should keep in mind when maybe the tool in five years no longer exists, or is that something? Um, maybe a few years ago I would have worried about that, but nowadays uh, it's really being used a lot. Like I said, also in open source, but also in closed source projects, it's being used more and more. And it's not one tool you're binding it to. Like you use PHP stand, for example. If PHP stand dies out, there's Psalm. If Psalm happens to die out, there's another tool. There's a bunch of tools out there. And the annotations of generics, even PHP Storm, for example, now understands um, these tools. So you even if you use them, actually, you get the errors in your PHP Storm if you're using that. Um, so you're not really tying it to one tool. You're tying it to static analysis as a whole. And I don't think that's a bad thing, per se. Cool. Thanks. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, we have it over there. Or are you just saying hi? <laughs> <laughs> um, you were talking a lot about uh, strict type PHP. Tell me, uh, would you dare use it without static analysis? Sir, you mean if I would use PHP, sta of PHP without static analysis? strictly typed PHP without static analysis, would you use it? If it has the same features as static analysis, sure. I mean, e eventually static analysis is just an add-on to the language because the language itself doesn't provide all these features. It doesn't have generics, unfortunately, and it doesn't have these checks that tell you what's wrong before the code is actually ran, which is the beauty of, for example, a compiler that it just tells you 
before the code is even executed, everything that could possibly go wrong. And I prefer my code not to go wrong all that much. So that's why I like to just have these tools. And if PHP would have provided it itself, I would have been real happy with it. Nope. OK. Any more questions? Uh, I really like green tea, though I'm partial to, I don't know the English word, but uh, rooibos. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't call myself a tea expert, though. Okay, any more questions or jokes? <laughs> I'll try one. That was Herd the Pachter at Punk Exterminator. Thank you. <laughs>